Hi, my name is Christy, and this is the American Chinese Food Show, where we analyze historical artifacts like vintage menus, recipe books, photographs, and text to tell the story of American Chinese food. In this episode, we're going back in time a bit. We dove into what people ate on the boat ride from China to the United States. We went through the upscale restaurant Mon Le Wan in New York. We talked about banquets in a lavish San Francisco Chinese restaurant. But what about the common folks who had to make the United States their temporary home? What did they eat? Let's try to put ourselves in the shoes of a Chinese worker in the early 1900s. You came from a village in southern China. You never cooked or did laundry once in your life because women in your family took care of that. But in the new world, that no longer was the case because less than one percent of the Chinese population were female. You were either a farmhand, a miner, a railroad laborer, or a laundryman. You were exhausted by the end of the day. People around you were all hungry bachelors. There was no family life and no home cooking, even if you wanted to make your own food. Quarters did not have private cooking facilities. So what did you eat? Hubert Howe Bancroft wrote in detail the living and meal situation in his book *West American History*, Volume 35, in 1902 under the chapter Mongolianism in America. The food is cooked on a brazier with an absurdly small amount of fuel. He said, "The produce dealer often unites a kitchen with his business, where the customer may prepare his food. Merchants have usually their own kitchen." A large patronage is diverted to the various boarding houses, which graduate from well-appointed restaurants to filthy cellars. At the latter, the accommodation is of the meanest kind: a bare plank table surrounded by benches, a big bowl of rice and pork in the center of the mess, each of whose members is provided with a pair of fidzi nimblets or chopsticks, about six inches in length, and with two small bowls, one for tea, the other for the rice. Scooping a bowlful from the common dish. The board at the cheapest restaurants costs from eight to ten dollars a month. It is certain that the staple food of our Chinese is boiled rice, which constitutes their bread. With this, they often mix the less favored potatoes and flavor the whole with pork, fish, or spice. A bowl of this, together with the never-failing tea, suffices for a meal. It's unclear from what Bancroft wrote what the dishes exactly were, but since we know the majority of the Chinese who arrived then were from a region called Xiyi,、uh, in the now Guangdong province, we can assume the dishes were Cantonese. There is an appendix on Chinese cooking in the book Chinatown Inside Out by Liang Guoyun. Published in 1936, it claims to be the first authentic book on Chinatown by a Chinese who knows what goes on. It might be a bit more useful than Bancroft's account. In Long's own words, it has long been my desire to make real Chinese food more popular among Americans. To this end, I add a list of ordinary Chinese dishes, easily ordered at any Chinese restaurant of any importance. I'm hoping we can find some clues as to what dishes common folks ate back in the time. Other than roasted meat like roast pork, roast chicken, or roast duck, which I doubt boarding houses were generous enough to provide to Chinese workers on a consistent basis, many dishes are familiar, like pepper stick with tomato, fan ke, la jiu niao, and Chinese white with pork or beef, bak choy ju or ao yu. Here, Chinese white is bak choy, as well as some Americanized dishes like Chinese omelet, fu yong dan, almond chicken, and mushroom chicken. Dishes like almond chicken and mushroom chicken are a testament on how Chinese food in America evolves with access to new ingredients. For example, the almonds we have in America are varieties like California and Michigan, from almond, a species of tree native to Iran and surrounding countries, while the varieties used in China are typically in soup, tea, tofu, or seeds of apricots. They are seen as medicinal. Listed as early as 200 BC in Shennong Banqiao Jing.
a book on agriculture and medicinal plant. There are sweet and bitter apricot seeds. We typically mix like about 80% sweet with 20% bitter as bitter apricot seeds are slightly poisonous leading to vertigo and more. I myself use apricot seeds to make Cantonese soup like watercress soup all the time but it's not something we use to for example make a stir fry dish with. We then have more common dishes like sweet pork ribs, tim sun pai guat, soy bean pork ribs, dao si pai guat, steamed fish, zing yu, steamed chicken, zing wat gai, fried fish with vegetable, cao yu pin, fried shrimp with tomato sauce, cao ha lo, and beef with oyster sauce, ho yao ngao yo. I can attest to the authenticity of this list as ordinary Chinese dishes because I grew up with dishes like these. This also reminds me instantly of the cheap lunch eateries all over Hong Kong today are still offering. A styrofoam box with a big scoop of rice on top of it, you pour a dish made of some protein, usually pork, some vegetables and a thick sauce. A hearty lunch that is going to give you energy for the rest of the day. Very much like what Bancroft described in boarding houses in the early 1900s. In Hong Kong, we call this dish rice, dip tao fan. Some trace the origin back to sidewalk stores in Central back in the 30s and 40s. This is the same for gai fan, offered in low-cost establishments in China that consist of a fish meat or vegetable topping served over rice. The first mention of gai fan, which is just something covering rice, uh, in literature was around 771 BC. Uh, we see something similar all across Asia as well. For example, in Japan, it's Donbori. Here's a menu of Boki, an eatery that has been operating on one of those narrow slopes in central and Hong Kong for decades. Um, it's open from 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Every day during lunchtime, office workers nearby place an order. A dish of rice is ready in less than a minute because all the toppings were prepped in dishes in a single portion. There are 34 items of some form of meat over rice, a few spare rib items, fermented black bean spare ribs, bitter melon spare ribs, and sweet and sour spare ribs. You see the similarities between this and in the book Chinatown Inside Out by Leon. And there's even the stick with tomato and a fuyong egg over rice as well. Um, there are also a few fried rice dishes, western style uh, fried rice, usually with ketchup, hot dog and frozen peas and carrots. Mixed fried rice, fujian fried rice. Boki clearly is not an upscale establishment, right? Uh, like a 5 US dollars for lunch is an amazingly economical option there, especially in Hong Kong. But if you ask me to come up with what basic food common folks eat today on a regular basis in Guangdong and Hong Kong, like in the traditional Cantonese um, cuisine, this would be my answer. And you bet at the end of the lunch, we all have a cup of tea, just like what Bancroft wrote, because Chinese people believe tea helps you digest food. And honestly, it is not that much unlike what Chinese American restaurants offer today. When you order an entree, it comes with rice. The concept is very similar. It's just the chicken, beef, pork, and seafood entrees are slightly different. I hope you like our episode today on Chinese cheap eats. Um, if you like our content, subscribe to our channel. See you soon.